Breaking news out of the United States Supreme Court, we have a heavyweight slugfest going on between the National Association for Gun Rights and the Illinois state government over whether or not the United States Supreme Court should intervene and enjoin the enforcement of the Illinois quote-unquote assault weapon ban, which deals with, of course, ordinary semi-automatic firearms and magazines that hold more than 10 rounds. Stay tuned, and we're going to report on the two major filings that have just taken place, both by the state of Illinois and the gun controllers there, and the Second Amendment plaintiffs on behalf of the National Association for Gun Rights. Stay tuned, we're going to break it down when we get back. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes of Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and the nominee for two 2024 Gundy Awards, one for the top male influencer in the Second Amendment space, and the other for the top voice of the Second Amendment. I am honored to be nominated for those two Gundy Awards for the year of our Lord 2024. All right, folks, major breaking news. We have a slugfest going on over our Second Amendment rights before none other than the United States Supreme Court. Specifically, in the case of the National Association for Gun Rights versus the city of Naperville, involving the various uh, assault weapon bans, and that's, of course, a political propaganda term, the phrase assault weapons, which is talking about really nothing more than ordinary semi-automatic handguns, semi-automatic uh, long guns, semi-automatic AR-15s, and magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, which are owned by the you know tens of millions of Americans maybe even over 100 million uh, when it comes to magazines. Nevertheless, these are obviously in common use by Americans for lawful purposes all across this great land. Now, Illinois, of course, has enacted various forms of bans here. Uh, these cases went up to the United States Court of Appeal for the Seventh Circuit in front of Judge Frank Easterbrook, a Republican nominee to the federal bench by President Ronald Reagan, but who, as you all know, is absolutely terrible on the Second Amendment and is an intellectual giant in his own mind. Unfortunately, just to Judge Easterbrook, uh, along with another panel member decided to enter an order that said that the Illinois assault weapon ban, again, propaganda term, uh, was constitutional under the Second Amendment. This is clearly thumbing their nose at the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, which is what the Seventh Circuit has been known to do uh, to the U.S. Supreme Court, and we're going to see what the Supreme Court does here. So what's happened here is the National Association for Gun Rights, along with other plaintiffs, have sought for the United States Supreme Court to intervene. Specifically, they are seeking an emergency application, an emergency application for an injunction pending review. What this means is, while the Seventh Circuit is considering whether or not to hear this case on Bonk, I believe, and whether or not the U.S. Supreme Court will hear uh, this case involving the Illinois quote-unquote assault weapon ban, whether or not they will hear that uh, uh, as part of a Supreme Court docket, pending the outcome or pending the results of those cases, uh, the, the uh, National Association for Gun Rights is asking the U.S. Supreme Court to put a pause on on the enforcement of the Illinois state law, really on the grounds it says that, well, look, you know, you've got millions of people whose Second Amendment rights are at stake. They could be going to prison if this if the courts get this wrong, and that's not fair. And the right answer is the enforcement of that law should be enjoined. It should be stopped pending a final resolution by the U.S. Supreme Court on whether or not the Illinois state law is constitutional. So right now, as you may recall, Justice Barrett, upon receiving this application from the National Association for Gun Rights and their excellent attorney, Barry Arrington, uh, essentially ordered the state of Illinois to submit, and all of the respondents, or all the defendants, uh, to submit an, uh, a response explaining why they think that an injunction should not be entered. And that was filed, I believe, just yesterday. And then this afternoon, on behalf of the Second Amendment plaintiffs, uh, the lawyers for the National Association for Gun Rights filed their reply brief in support of the injunction, and uh, that's what we're going to go over now. The bottom line is the anti-gunners, the state of Illinois, uh, and their handmaidens, if you will, and their lawyers went exactly where I knew they would go, where we've talked about before. They went specifically toward the procedural arguments, the procedural arguments as to why the U.S. Supreme Court should not grant this injunction. And as you know, just as a reminder, procedure or process is the way a court goes through uh, where a legal case moves through the courts from the trial court all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court potentially. And then you have substantive law, which is specifically what the Second Amendment means and how it applies in a particular case. So really what the uh, Illinois defendants are hanging their legal hat on is the procedural arguments. And they really make three arguments. They say, first of all, there is no circuit split on this question 
about whether or not you can ban these semi-automatic handguns and semi-automatic long guns, AR-15s, and therefore the court should not grant it because there's no circuit split. There's no uh, law that needs to be resolved among the various circuits where some courts uh, in some circuits rule one way on the issue and then other circuits rule another way. Now, this is absolutely going to be impossible for, I think, the Second Amendment community to ever satisfy because the reality is you're not going to have red states enacting gun ban laws that can then be ruled unconstitutional by so-called red state judges, if you will. So you're only going to have blue states enacting gun bans like New York, New Jersey, California, and they're going to go up to really blue state courts um, and they will be upheld. So there will never be another side of the question because you'll never have uh, gun bans in the states that arguably have favorable courts to rule against them, so you will never technically have a circuit split, which is one of the classic reasons why the U.S. Supreme Court will hear a case. So that's one issue here, right here, right now. The second argument, of course, we've talked about this before, that the U.S. Supreme Court, as a general matter, as a general matter, does not like to hear cases on what are no, what's known as an interlocutory basis. The reason why they don't like to hear cases on an interlocutory basis is because that means that the appeal is occurring during the middle of a case, during the middle of a case, and not at the end of the case. And the U.S. Supreme Court does not like to get involved in cases in the middle of it as a general matter. Why? Because they feel like uh, they will be in a better position to issue and make a wise, informed ruling at the end of the case after all the arguments have been heard, all the decisions have been had, and there's a final judgment, and then it comes up to them. That is generally how they like to do things. Because this case involving the National Association for Gun Rights uh, right now is up on a preliminary injunction, there is no final ruling yet. There's no final judgment yet in this case. The argument by the defendants here is that the U.S. Supreme Court should wait to rule when there is a final judgment and not before. Uh, and of course, the last point they like to make is simply trying to make this argument that there's more uh, Better for the, It's better for the U.S. Supreme Court to wait for these issues to be percolating, to be resolved in the various courts across the country, give it more time and more time and more time. Now, we all know what this really means. is a, The anti-gun lobby, as I see it, and those that support gun control are really want to delay, 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 hoping that the U.S. Supreme Court's composition will change in a way that's friendly, where they can replace Clarence Thomas or Samuel Alito with a anti-gun, anti-Second Amendment, anti-Bill of Rights, liberal justice. Um, that is their ultimate goal, and that is why they there is these ongoing delays. They want to deny any Second Amendment precedent uh, that they can possibly do with the current court because they're not satisfied. And until they can pack the courts or do something else to change uh, the rule of law and the respect for the Constitution, uh, which is basically upheld by the current composition of the court, uh, to interpret and apply the Constitution as it's written... Um, the anti-gun movement, as I see it, doesn't do not want any additional cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. So they're just trying to say, buy time, buy time. All of this, of course, is silly because the U.S. Supreme Court has already ruled in the Heller case exactly how you deal with gun bans rules and gun ban laws. And there's really no need for more percolation because we know that AR-15s, AK-47s, the semi-automatic version, of course, and magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, we all understand entirely that these are already owned by tens of millions of Americans, which is exactly why the anti-gun movement is trying to ban them every day, including this week in the U.S. Congress, because they're ubiquitous. There are too many of them. And by virtue of trying to ban them because there are too many weapons of war out there, so they say, uh, of course, this is literally in a concession and admission they're in common use by Americans for lawful purposes, and they cannot be banned under the Heller standard. So on the procedural process, the lawyers for the National Association for Gun Rights came back and pointed out that in the case of Roman Catholic Diocese versus Cuomo, which was a COVID-era case involving really shutting down churches and religious places of uh, religious worship, during the COVID era, the U.S. Supreme Court entered an injunction on the grounds that this likely violated the First Amendment right to free exercise of religion. And as a consequence, uh, the lawyers here are relying upon that precedent to say that the Illinois law is so egregious that it likely violates the Second Amendment right of all those millions of Illinois residents, and thus it should be enjoined. As to what the U.S. Supreme Court does, uh, it's going to be hard to say. I think it's probably technically an uphill battle here because the U.S. Supreme Court has already looked at the Seventh Circuit case here, and they previously denied an injunction pending the outcome of an appeal. With that said, this is a distinct and a separate argument and, and potentially distinguishable from what happened back then because if you recall over the summer, when the first application to enjoin the Illinois law 
cause pending the resolution of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. When that occurred, Judge Easterbrook immediately entered an expedited order to say, we're going to hear oral argument in this case in just a couple weeks. We're going to go really fast, Supreme Court, so don't mess with us. And that is likely why the U.S. Supreme Court did not do anything with it because the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals was acting with speed. So the question is going to be is what is going to happen here and now? Uh, I do think it's a little bit different, but I think because the Supreme Court's already looked at the Seventh Circuit and refused to enter an injunction several months ago, I do think it's arguably an uphill battle here to win this. Nevertheless, I think it's a worthwhile try and we'll see what happens shortly. But let's go down a quick list of some of the arguments that are going back and forth here. The one thing that's very interesting is that Illinois has admitted, they've essentially admitted that the ban in Illinois does indeed cover the ban of certain semi-automatic handguns. That is quite interesting because the Heller case, as you know, was actually struck down the District of Columbia's ban on handguns on the grounds that handguns were in common use by Americans for lawful purposes and thus they could not be banned under the so-called dangerous and unusual test, which is what gave rise uh, from Heller, came out of Heller after the U.S. Supreme Court did the analysis of text first, concluding that handguns are arms because an arm is anything that can be used offensively or defensively. And after that, they looked to see if there's any historical tradition of, you know, reg of banning these kinds of arms. And the answer undeniably was no in Heller. And that was why why uh, they could not ban the handguns. But here you have a situation where Illinois has admitted that they are banning semi-automatic handguns and their argument is very interesting. They're really saying that because the Heller case did not specifically mention semi-automatic handguns, the U.S. Supreme Court has not ruled on whether or not semi-automatic handguns are protected arms because the Heller case just talked about handguns generally and not semi-automatic handguns in specific. But this is not really true because in the Caetano case in 2016 and the concurrence by Justice Alito and Justice Thomas, they make an obvious point that semi-automatic handguns are protected under Heller as are revolvers. And since the most commonly owned handgun in America today is semi-automatic pistols, more so than revolvers, those would obviously be protected if you're honest about how to apply Heller. But I would not expect, uh, you know, I expect the anti-gunners to make every conceivable argument and every single distinction and nuance that they can to try to delay the process and try to win their case. That's what good lawyers do. And they have good lawyers on the other side uh, against the Second Amendment. So we have to deal with these kinds of arguments. But I do think at the end of the day, Heller clearly applies to all modern firearms, uh, including all modern semi-automatic pistols. The next interesting argument here of course, we've talked about this before, is that at the end of the day, there is no need to do historical analog work because the Supreme Court has already done the historical analog work in the Heller case. I think the National Association of Gun Rights Brief does a good job of this, pointing out that at the textual level, at the textual level, all arms, as in anything that can be used offensively or defensively, are protected by the text of the Second Amendment because semi-automatic rifles, AR-15s, and the like are protected arms because they can be used offensively or def defensively at a textual level. They fall within the right of the people to keep and bear arms because they are arms as defined by Heller, again, which is anything that can be used offensively or defensively. That's not my definition. That's the definition the U.S. Supreme Court adopted. Quoting founding era dictionary uh, creators known as lexicographer Samuel Johnson, who's English, and Noah Webster, who's the first American lexicographer of American style English. So again, uh, at the textual level, it's obviously that all the arms that are being banned in Illinois are arms and can be protected under the text. So then you go to the historical analysis, but again, the Supreme Court has already done the historical analysis in 2008 in Heller and concluded that if the only conceivable, the only conceivable theory that one could advance to ban a modern firearm would be if that arm is dangerous and unusual. Dangerous and unusual. They did not say that's the only way guns can be, you know, they, they didn't get into all the details because they didn't need to. Because if you're talking about what we're debating right now, which are semi-automatic firearms like AR-15s, semi-automatic AK-47s, uh, magazines at home are the 10 rounds, handguns of all sorts, these are obviously in common use by Americans for lawful purposes, which means by definition. They cannot be dangerous and unusual. And I think the National Association for Gun Rights Brief does a good job of pointing this out. The one thing I might have sort of done a bit, bit more nuance here uh, um, on this brief, I might have emphasized it a little bit differently is I really might have hammered home a little bit harder that the burden on showing that an arm is in common use by Americans for lawful purposes is not a burden that the Second Amendment plaintiffs have to bear. That is not accurate. It is the burden of, it is the burden of the government to show that whatever they are trying to ban is dangerous and unusual, and thus they must show that these weapons are not 
in common use by Americans for lawful purposes, which of course is 100% impossible for them to do if we're honest. So what's happening here, and this is extremely important to understand this, and I think the National Association of Gun Rights did a pretty good job of this, although I might have emphasized it a little bit more, maybe a little bit more up front, uh, but I think it's fine. I think they made the, all the right arguments. I think I might have really said that the burden, once the text is satisfied, which obviously these are handguns and the, these are handguns and rifles and they're for their arms, the burden shifts to the government and it's up to the government. It's up to the government of Illinois to bear the burden to show they're not in common use. I think the way I read this brief, it's a little suggestive that the burden of proof is on the Second Amendment community to show that these arms are in common use by Americans for lawful purposes. Now, this, of course, is very easy to do because there's countless studies and surveys and information. And again, the uh, anti-gun movement has essentially admitted this fact because they're arguing there are too many of these kinds of guns. There's too many of these magazines that are out there in circulation, which all of those statements made on the con uh, you know on the House floor, on the Senate floor, and all across the country is essentially an admission that these are ubiquitous arms and they certainly are. There's no debate that there's tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of these things out there. So again, the laser focus should be on the Second Amendment plaintiff, like a criminal defendant in a case, once the text is satisfied, which obviously it really is because the right of the people to keep in their arms, i.e., uh, guns uh, shall not be infringed. It's obviously implicated. So now the burden shifts to the government and the burden has the burden to show that these things are not in common use and they cannot do it so they automatically lose. But what the anti-gunners are trying to do is they're trying to elevate, and I, I warned you about this before, the anti-gun movement wants to conflate the historical analysis with the textual analysis. So what the really, what the anti-gun movement in America wants to do, and they've tried to do it here in the Illinois case, is to try to rewrite the text of the Second Amendment. So it reads as follows, that the right of the people to keep and bear commonly owned arms shall not be infringed. This is 100% wrong, 100% terrible for the Second Amendment, and we must never make this mistake, and we must be very clear at all times that, again, the text just requires that something be an arm, and to be an arm, according to the Supreme Court, it just requires it to be used, potentially can be used offensively or defensively, it, which obviously is all guns in America and all magazines in America. So once that happens, the burn shifts to the government. So what's happening is the reason why the income, the anti-gunners want the in common use test to be elevated to the text is why. You know why if you watch this channel. It's because the burden at the textual level is on the Second Amendment plaintiffs to show that the conduct of the Second Amendment plaintiffs or the gun control law is implicated by the text of the Second Amendment. The burden arguably is on the Second Amendment plaintiffs at that level. So the government always wants to make sure the burden is not on them, which is why it's so important to show, and this is clearly the case because Heller makes this clear, that when it comes to the historical analysis, and remember the dangerous and unusual test, which the flip side is if something's in common use, it cannot be dangerous and unusual, it cannot because it cannot be unusual, and all the things we're talking about now are not dangerous and unusual because they're obviously commonly owned, commonly used. So again, we want the burden to always be on the government, but you can see that the government is trying to shift the burden to the Second Amendment plaintiff to say, you have to show that these weapons are in common use. No, we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. The Second Amendment community has no burden whatsoever to show any of these banned arms in Illinois or anywhere else are in common use. We don't have to do anything. We can literally sit on our hands and watch the sun go by. Now, the next interesting thing here is on page four of the National Association of Gun Rights Brief. They're proving my point of how brick by brick by brick things add up. Specifically, they cite to the victory we experienced in front of Judge Benitez in California, and they are quoting and relying upon a lot of the work that he did. And this goes back to the point that every one of these little victories, some district court in Illinois, some district court in California, these can all be used later on. So that's when I tell you things are major breaking news. Um, the, the reason why they are major breaking news may be because they can be a stepping stone or a brick in our wall to protect our rights in future cases. These are known as legal precedents that other future courts can use to support them. And again, here we have uh, in the brief by the National Association of Gun Rights a lot of reliance upon some of the great analysis and conclusions and citations brought about by Judge Benitez in California, an example of how prior victories can be used to win future victories, and that's how the legal process works. My final point, I just want to clarify one thing on page nine. Uh, there's a quote to Professor uh, Mark Smith, who is a handsome YouTuber, I'm sure you can all agree. 
but anyway, uh, I would clarify it a little bit. The way this is written, it says, quote, as Professor Smith explained in his recent article under Heller and Bruin, Second Amendment cases are divided into two categories. Number one, laws that ban weapons in common use and laws that otherwise regulate the sale or use of arms. Then they quote to uh, me uh, in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy per occurring for 2023. Uh, this is a pretty good proposition, but I would tweak it slightly. Uh, I, if I were writing this brief, uh, I would have said that the Second Amendment cases break into two categories. This is true. The first category is simply banning weapons, period, full stop. The in common use is not relevant at the textual level. So the first category cases are those that deal with arms ban cases, and the second deals with all other things involving the regulation of use and sale and whatnot of firearms. So I might not have uh, said laws that ban weapons in common use. I might have just said laws that ban weapons, period, full stop. I don't think this is a big deal here, but I think going forward, uh, we want to be clear that we're talking about arms ban cases on the one hand and all other types of cases on the other hand. And the reason why we want to continue to draw that distinction is because in the arms ban cases, as I point out, it's very easy for us to win those cases because the Heller case already did all the work for us. And I know that the anti-gun movement hates the fact that Heller is still the law of the land and they're trying to pretend that it's not because they want to go back to the well. They want to go back and redo all the work and hope to get a different outcome because they got killed the last time in the Heller case. It's ultimately not going to work. And the good news is the U.S. Supreme Court is extremely smart. They're extremely sophisticated. They're going to totally understand all of how this works and they're going to get exactly what I'm saying and they're going to agree with me because basically I am telling them what they are or what they already know. So in some ways, I'm simply interpreting what they've already said and I think what they already understand to be the case. So uh, we don't have to educate them that much on this issue because they know exactly what they said and what they meant. And it's very difficult to misconstrue the words to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, if you're part of the anti-gun movement because the Supreme Court knows exactly what they said and what they did and there's no room for interpretation or error or anything like that because, again, they're the ones that came up with these tests. They're the ones that applied the law and they know what they did in the past and they, there's no doubt in my mind they will uh, get this right. Now, as to whether or not they're going to grant this emergency relief uh, or not, I don't know. I think it's a little bit of an uphill battle because I still think they're letting these cases wind their way through the system. If I were on the court, I certainly would look seriously about enjoying this law. It seems unfair uh, that you have all those millions of Illinois residents that are potentially going to be felons with this law being litigated. And ultimately, we may win this case. I mean, the Second Amendment community may win this case. So it does seem a little unfair. Uh, nevertheless, the Supreme Court has a lot of other institutional concerns, including how um, you know, how they deal with other cases involving constitutional rights. And if the Second Amendment is going to be treated like all other constitutional rights, uh, well, then they have to treat it as such. And they may not want a situation where they're given priority to Second Amendment cases over other cases involving other aspects of the Bill of Rights. Again, I'm not on the Supreme Court. We don't know what they're thinking. Uh, but we certainly will know more in the next several weeks as they consider this emergency application by the National Association of Gun Rights. But anyway, it's a powerful brief. I'm going to put links to uh, the government's brief down below, as well as to this reply brief. Uh, powerful stuff going back and forth. Great advocacy on both sides. And again, I think we have the better argument intellectually. Nevertheless, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I think. It's all what the courts and our legislators do um, for better or for worse. It's up to them. Okay? All right, folks. Hope you learned a little bit something here today at the Four Box of Diner. If you haven't subscribed or shared this video, please do so. And uh, don't forget to follow me on X at Four Boxes of Diner. And we will see you again soon. Here at the Four Boxes Diner. Order's up. Table 2A.